Okay, good morning. It's 10 a.m. and that means it's time for Little Fire Ant Control. So sure everybody's really excited for that. We got great weather today, so hopefully we'll get through this webinar and you can run out and get what you need and get started today. Um, I'm Franny Brewer from Big Island Invasive Species Committee and we have our whole outreach team on here. Uh, we have Kavehi Lopez, who's gonna be handling our Facebook Live today. So if you have questions, you can pop those in in the chat and she will uh, answer those. And we have Molly Murphy, who's going to be handling question and answers here on Zoom. So again, using that question and answer box is gonna be the easiest way to um, get your questions taken care of. And you can ask questions during the presentation. Periodically, we'll stop in and chat with Jade, but um, we'll try and answer as we go. So feel free to uh, use that question and answer rather than the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the chat, but not as often as the question and answer box. So try and keep your eye on that. Um, and on Facebook, you can just go ahead and put that in the discussion. So that brings us to our presenter today, Jade Miyashiro. And Jade is our little fire ant technician and outreach specialist and um, little fire ant whisperer at Big Island Invasive Species <laughs> Committee. Uh, she is a graduate of the agricultural program at UH Hilo. Uh, she worked for the Extension Service, uh, CTAR, under Dr. Arnold Harris, who did a lot of research on cookie frogs and little fire ants. So she came to us with a lot of background in those pests, which I'm sure we all have a lot of background with those pests at this point. And she is going to be taking us through some information about invasive species and then really getting into the nitty gritty of little fire ants, uh, learning about the ant, what parts of the ant behavior and biology do you need to know in order to control properly. And then we're going to talk about products and what you can use and how you should use them. So um, without any further ado, Jade, I'm going to turn it over to you. You want to say hi to the folks watching at home and then uh, share your screen? Uh, hey guys, let me get this opened up real quick. There we go. Every, is, everyone can see the screen now, hopefully. Hey, awesome. Okay, I'll get started. Let me move this real quick, get it out of my way. Okay, so I'll just I'll just dive right into it. We'll start talking about um, who we are real real quick. Uh, we're the Big Island Invasive Species Committee, like Franny had mentioned. Uh, we're kind of a research project through the university, and we work with a bunch of different organizations, ranging from uh, the state, the county, to even other uh, conservation groups. Uh, before I get uh, into anything else. I'm going to stop for like a quick second to say mahalo to our funders. Um, with these guys help, essentially we can provide you all this information and things for free. Uh, so before we talk about fire ants, I'm going to take a little bit to talk about invasive species, uh, which are introduced things that were brought to Hawaii, whether it was on purpose or by mistake that causes damage in one of these three areas. Um, it could be the harm to the environment, harm to our economy, or human health. And Hawaii added way of life to the human health portion because even if it's um, not harmful, it, it can affect us in some way. Um, we do a lot of work in early detection and rapid response, meaning when things come in, we try to catch it right away before it um, goes beyond what we call like the scope of eradication before there's essentially nothing we can do about it. So hopefully a lot of these plants we are currently working on, you'll never hear of them because that means we've successfully gotten rid of them. I'm gonna give you a few quick numbers uh, just to kind of uh, give you an idea of what's going on in Hawaii. Uh, we get about 100 ships per day coming in, um, 790,000 flights per year, maybe a little less this year, but during a normal year, that's about how much we get, uh, 7.8 million tons of cargo, and with all that stuff coming in, all this traffic, we only have 82 inspectors statewide. So that's uh, a lot of work for a very limited amount of people to do. And in some cases, um, they may not even have like the proper facilities to check all these things. So because of all that uh, struggle, essentially, that the Department of Ag has to go through, we get about one new insect species coming into Hawaii a day, and about 17 of those established each year, uh, meaning that out of those, um, all those insects that come in, 17 of them uh, survive and they can reproduce. So just because something gets here, 
um, it may die off after a couple weeks and or it may never reproduce so it's kind of benign they don't really do anything but it's when they survive for a while and then uh, reproduces when we start having problems. So I'm going to go over a few of the invasive species that have come in within the past like 10, 20 years that have been uh, huge and you probably heard of them. Uh, coffee berry borer came in 2010. I hope you guys can't hear the cat that really wants to come in. <laughs> Please excuse him. Um, the coffee berry borer came in and it essentially cut the coffee production in half. Um, they used to be able to produce um, 80 to 100 bags of coffee per acre. Now it's down to 30 to 50 pound uh, uh, bags. So they essentially are losing half of their uh, profit just from this one pest. And coffee farmers have to deal with um, other insects, other diseases. So just this one thing is was huge for them. Um, I'm sure you, most of you have heard about uh, the cokey frog and the nettle caterpillar. Uh, they've been around for like maybe the past 20 years. Uh, Koki frog is still spreading throughout the big island and uh, get, it is getting to neighbor islands uh, occasionally. Um, the nettle caterpillar was really big in the early 2000s. It was actually kind of horrifying if you've ever encountered one. Uh, if you brush up against all those little spines, it made really horrible, painful, itchy rash uh, things going on. But they did release a biocontrol so you don't see it as often anymore, which is good. Um, Hollow scale, we don't have it on the big island just yet. It's only on Maui. Uh, this is a good example of uh, how it damages our way of life. Because, of course, you know, Hala, they use the leaves for weaving and things like that. If it's covered in these insects, it'll make um, the, the leaves ugly and brittle, and essentially you can't use it anymore. So while it doesn't really affect um, our health, uh, per se, it does affect, it is a, has a cultural importance. Uh, Niothrip is a good example of uh, environmental harm. Uh, Nio is like the second most important dry uh, dryland forest tree and to this day they haven't really recovered uh, from this one insect. And then of course we have rapid ohia death. Uh, still a lot of research going on about it. Uh, one of the strains they estimate came about maybe 20 or 30 years ago but there's still a lot of things uh, going on with this but this is another horrible invasive species. Uh, one of the more recent things you guys have heard about, we've been talking about this a lot, especially if you're uh, on our Facebook page, is the Queensland longhorn beetle. Um, the first detection was actually in 2019, but it seems to have really exploded in the past two years. Uh, this guy's really scary. It seems to go after almost everything. It, it'll uh, attack and destroy cacao, ulu, uh, citrus, uh, and a bunch of other things that we're still, the list is still growing. We're still studying it. Um, where it's native ranges in um, in Queensland, it, this is not a pest and essentially it doesn't do anything. So there's almost no information on it. So we're currently uh, working with USDA and HDOA to even discover the basic things about this guy, such as the um, life cycle, um, how long does it take to pupate and all that stuff. So it's all being researched still. And this is this tiny little guy, uh, the two-line spittle bug. It's actually one of the scarier things that I've gotten here in the past couple years. Um, essentially, what this this guy is a uh, ranchland pest. So you can see in the background, uh, this picture was taken in October 2018, and just a few months later, all the grass is dead. So that's what this guy does. He kills all the grass in the pasture. Um, so there's nothing for the the cows to eat. And what happens after all the grass dies is the weeds come in and the cows don't eat that. So now this is essentially like just wasted pasture land. And still same thing, bunch of research going on about it. Uh, but right now there's no real, uh, nothing can really kill it right now or there's no pesticides labeled for it. So all these things are still in the works so we're all still fighting against these invasive species. And if you kind of noticed as the timeline went on, like almost every couple of years is another horrible invasive species. So just a, a little scary tidbit, like Hoi is home to 50 of the world's worst 100 invasive species. So hopefully we can keep the other half of this list out. Okay, before I start talking about little fire ants, do we have any questions on invasive species in general? Jade, we don't have any questions on Zoom. No questions. 
Okay, awesome. I'll just keep going. So remember those three things that I mentioned, like what makes something invasive, like the environment, uh, the economy, and human health. So the reason fire ants or little fire ants are on that top 100 worst list is because they do all three of those things. So if you've had little fire ants on your property, you may have noticed, oh, I don't have roaches anymore. I don't have spiders or even cokey frogs. Um, these guys are, are aggressive towards um, other animals and insects. They'll kind of chase everybody else away. Um, so this will also happen in like in um, the environment. They'll attack um, other insects, including our native insects. They'll go after uh, baby turtles and things like that if it's on the beach and any nesting birds. So anything in their way, they'll kind of try to force them out. So we don't need that in some of our very like uh, fragile native ranges. And uh, they're also really bad for the economy. Um, essentially, if you're a farmer, you don't want to have little fire ants. On top of um, it being hard to get someone to pick your fruit if it's covered in fire ants, they also have to deal with um, a lot of extra costs. Um, besides the, the cost of treating the fire ants themselves, um, they also have to deal with a whole lot of other pests, such as uh, mealybugs, aphids, white flies. That's this little white stuff you can see on the right side of the screen. Um, I believe those are white fly. Uh, so basically what happens, little fire ants kind of ranch these other insects, these other like pests. Um, so it, they're kind of like their cows. They'll move them around from plant to plant and they'll protect them from other predators. Uh, the reason being is these other insects secrete something called honeydew, which is almost like sugar water. Uh, so that's where the ants are getting their sugar and their carbohydrates from. It's from these other insects. And if you've ever seen these things in your garden, you, um, they can kind of like really uh, harm the health of the plant. They pass diseases, they suck out all the nutrients, and they also come with um, black sooty mold a lot of the time. You can see it at the, on the stem of this plant. So if you're a farmer, you have to treat for your fire ants, you have to treat something for uh, the aphids and mealybugs and the sooty mold. So the costs just keep going up and up and up. And so there was a study done a few years ago. They estimated that just the little fire ants is gonna cost $1 billion to the Hawaii's agricultural industry like over the next decade or so. So that's a lot of money wasted on just one uh, invasive species. Uh, and of course, uh, little fires are harmful to us. Um, if you've ever been stung, I don't need to tell you how horrible it is, uh, but it, it does vary from person to person. Uh, some people report that uh, it itches and stings pretty bad for a few hours and then it goes away. Um, other people have said they get welts that last for weeks and it's like absolutely horrible. Um, it also affects um, other animals, like this poor kitty in this picture. Um, this is something they call like fire ant eye or um, any of those similar things. Um, basically the ants are stinging the eyes of the pets. It'll get onto their face and they, they can't get, you know, they can't get the ants off their face and ends up stinging their eyes. Um, this is kind of a severe case. Uh, normally it starts off as like one little white speckle or two. Uh, we talked to the guys at the Humane Society, in the Humane Society on uh, Puna, and they did say that almost 100% of the animals come in with some kind of fire ant uh, damage. It may not be this bad, but it will be like maybe a couple white speckles or two. Um, not too sure what exactly is causing it, whether it's the toxin itself from the ants or if it's just scratching the surface of the eye and other things are getting in. Uh, not sure um, exactly, but the vets have told us that when they, the animals do get moved like indoors or to a place where there's no fire ants, it does clear up a tiny bit, but it's never back to like what it used to be. Um, and that same report that did the agricultural loss, they did a, um, almost like a sting count. They're like, how many stings do we get in the next couple years? And they said 2.3 billion more stings in the next 35 years. So if you're one of the lucky few that haven't gotten a fire ant sting yet, uh, you're, you're, you'll get one eventually, unfortunately. And they said maybe 1 billion of those things are going to go to our pets. Uh, some of the things we've just heard people tell us was, oh, I have fire ants in a far quarter of my property or something, and they can stay there. That's not necessarily what's going to happen. Um, they'll keep moving until uh, they can't anymore, until they take over your house and they're living in there. Um, 
So they've been reported to live at 20,000 ants per square meter. That's what we like to call peak ant. So square meter is not that big. 20,000 ants is a lot for that small section in including 70 queens. So if you had that high level of ants in and around your home, that's essentially unlivable. You'd be getting stung constantly. So when did they get here? Um, little fire ants were first detected in 1999. Uh, they managed to track it um, all the way back to Florida. Uh, they collected the first couple samples, DNA tested, and it matched the fire, uh, little fire ants that they had in Florida. Came in on a shipment of palm trees, and they did what um, all nurseries do: they sold their their trees. And so by the time they tried, they oh, they found the little fire ant, and they're like, okay, we need to figure out how far these things have gotten. Uh, it took them from 1999, 2002, so like three years uh, to make this one map. And at that point, the ants were already spread from Lapahoyhoy to Kapoho. And that's already beyond the scope of eradication. So even at that time, it was when they first found it, it was too far gone to stop. And at this, and at this point, there was also nothing they could really do to treat it. So since then, we've been kind of been doing our own mapping. So this is all the places we've gone out and uh, done talks to or help, help tr uh, do with treatments and things like that. So essentially, there's little fire ants all over the big island. So we, we still uh, come into contact with people who from Kona, from Volcano, are like, oh, I live in this in this area. We don't have fire ants. May, may not necessarily be true. Just assume that if you live on the big island, there's always a possibility you might have fire ants. Okay, so the scientific name for little fire ants was Mania auropunctata. They're originally from South America, uh, but we, and they somehow got to Florida and then Florida shared it with us. They have their own invasive species problems over there. Um, unlike other ants, um, little fire ants are arboreal, meaning they live in trees. Um, so they don't make any of those cool like ant nests that you can sometimes see that the other these other species do. And they'll pretty much, uh, live any place where there's some shade and moisture. So you can see from this picture, this is just, I picked off some moss on a tree and there was a whole nest under there. Um, and this is why these guys are a little special. They're not like bees where bees only have a singular queen. These guys have many queens. So if you can see all the, in this picture, there's a bunch of jelly bean shape. There's some tiny ones and some huge ones. Uh, those larger jelly bean shapes are all baby queens or males. Um, so essentially what will happen, all these uh, queens will hatch or emerge and they'll take a few workers with them and they'll move a little bit, little bit away from the colony and start a new nest. So those, they'll, these guys will all move and they'll spread really, uh, relatively quickly, um, close distance. So you'll go from having one nest to two, then to four, and they'll keep going on that way. And one of the reasons they're so hard to get rid of is because you can have um, multiple queens per nest, and then you have many nests that uh, kind of make a web on your property, and they all stay in contact with each other. They're not aggressive within uh, the species. So I could take a worker from, let's say, I have a singular worker from Kona, drop it off at a helo nest, and he'll, uh, she'll move right in. Um, they're like, oh yeah, we're the same species. Yeah, just come on in, because they're all related, essentially. So that's another reason why they're so difficult to treat. Um, as scary as I make these guys sound, um, it is possible to get rid of them on your property. Um, I'm going to be going over essentially the best strategies to um, treat for little fire ants and all these things that uh, I'll be covering. Um, the university and the Hawaii and I has done years and years of research on this. Yeah, so don't worry, it is very treatable. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is talk about surveying which is probably one of the most important things you can do. Whoops. Um, we, we still hear this from people. Oh, I don't have fire ants. And our follow-up question is always, did you survey? And a lot of times they say, no, they just like, I don't get stung, it's fine. Uh, not necessarily true. You could have fire ants for a couple years or at least a year before you even notice them. Um, they start off really quietly on your property. There's only, a, there's only like a couple of nests. They kind of don't bother anybody. But until they spread to the point you're encountering them, then there's probably a lot at that point. 
Um, serving is super easy. All you need is um, chopstick, something similar, uh, cheap peanut butter, and that's it. Uh, if you are allergic to peanut butter, you can use Spam or hot dogs and stuff like that too, and it works just as well. Something with a uh, protein in it. Um, so what you would do is uh, take the chopstick with the peanut butter, place it in suspect areas, wait half an hour, go back and get it and see if there's ants there. Um, and I'll play this video for you guys. Um, this is also on our website, so if you do need a quick refresher, maybe like a minute long, you can um, always go on our website and watch it again. Um, so when you're doing your survey, just kind of keep in mind the places little fire ants like. So I did mention they like uh, lots of nooks and crannies, so that's why the first place in this video was like a rock wall. And then of course, we all know they do like trees, uh, mossy places. So those are all places I would put um, a peanut butter stick. Um, the reason trash cans are mentioned in this video is because they are protein seekers. They will go for like our kitchen rubbish and stuff like that. Uh, and one super important thing, um, there are lots of um, species of ants on, uh, in Hawaii, there's maybe like 60 or so of them, and a lot of them are tiny orange ants. Um, so if you do, um, you're unsure if it is fire ants, you can always uh, freeze them overnight to kill them and then send it to us. I'll go to, I'll skip over to this real quick. Um, so just because it's tiny and orange or because something stung you doesn't mean it's a fire ant, just to make 100% sure you can always send it to us. Um, in the mail, it's a uh, free service. Uh, just make sure to include your name and a contact info. Um, because I, we, cur we are currently working from home, it may take me a little longer to get uh, your results back, but yeah, just uh, give us maybe a week or so. Um, and then I can call you back and discuss if we have fire ants or not. Uh, it's really hard to uh, tell just by looking at it. You need a microscope to like count all the little things on them to make sure it is a fire ant. Um, so this is just a quick example of like how you would uh, put out your um, peanut butter sticks. So as you can kind of see all the red dots in this picture, place where there's a lot of vegetation, lots of shade, um, up into the trees if you can get, if you can reach into the crooks of trees, if not just at the base is good enough. Um, and some other things that are not in this picture, um, Water tanks and electrical boxes. A lot of times when they're coming into your homes, it's they're, they're coming for water. So the first places you'll see them is uh, the bathroom and the kitchen. So if you have um, a water tank outside or if you have spigots or sinks outside, those are also places you wanna check first. And they have a weird thing about electricity. They'll, they like to go and check out um, like uh, water pumps and things like that. Like, oh, there's electricity in here and they'll get shocked and die and they keep piling on and doing that until they short whatever it is. I've seen them living in a um, a wall socket before and it was kind of scary when you plug something in and it all the ants come flooding out. Um, so the one of the main things I want you guys to remember from this presentation is whether or not you think you have fire ants or if you treated for fire ants and you don't have them anymore, you're still gonna wanna survey at least a couple times a year. That's gonna be the big thing that we're gonna to need to do from now on. Hey, do we have any questions on serving before I get into treating? Okay, we don't have any questions on serving. We did have a question about um, uh, fire ants on other islands, which um, yes, is the answer. There are fire ants on the other islands. Uh, so if you are on another island, or if you have family or friends on other islands that you really want to uh, make sure that these fire ants don't spread on the other islands like they have on the big island, uh, we really, really encourage any of our inner island viewers to take the advice that Jade just gave about surveying and do that in your own backyard. What we do know for sure is that there are fire ant populations on other islands that have not yet been discovered. There are active sites being treated on several islands, um, Oahu and Maui, and I believe there's one site on Kauai at this time, um, but we don't uh, know where all the fire ants are right now. And the only way they're found is someone going out into their backyard, into their work area, wherever they may be, and serving for them. So uh, I just wanna kind of 
put that out there because we may have some inner island viewers today. But uh, I don't see any other questions on Zoom about surveying. Uh, is there anything, Molly, over on, or Kabeki over on Facebook? Nothing yet. Okay, awesome. And if you are on um, a neighbor island and you do the survey and you have like a bunch of ants you don't know what to do with, you can always take it to the, uh, the Department of Ag there and they should be able to identify it for you. Okay, so now I'll get into treatment. Um, I just want to mention, I'm going to probably end up saying a lot of different products, a lot of different um, active ingredients. Uh, don't worry about writing any of this down or too quickly. Um, a lot of this, or such, all of the all of the things I'm going to say is on our website. Uh, the product names, there's printable things you can take to the store with you. Uh, so don't worry about it too much. But you can always ask later on at the end, like, what was that product that did this and this? So we can kind of recap it at the end if you guys need. Um, another thing to remember, um, no matter which you decide in the end to use, all these products have been tested um, by the university. Uh, by the Hawaii Ant Lab, they're, they're all equally effective. There's not one that's significantly better than the rest. Uh, but the main thing is you want to be consistent. You want to treat on time. That's much more important than choosing which product you want to use. Um, and the, the window you need is you need to treat every four to six weeks too soon. And uh, these ants are really clever. They'll kind of remember, oh, this thing made us sick last time and they won't eat it. And if you wait longer than six weeks, the queen has already uh, replaced all the workers that have died and you're back to where you started. So four to six weeks is the thing you want to remember. Um, something that makes it really hard um, for the common homeowner, um, little fire ant is a, or not little, regular fire ants is a common name. Um, there's a bunch of fire ant and stinging ants. Um, so it's difficult to go to, especially these big box stores and grab something that is this kills fire ants. Uh, a lot of times it's meant for those big mounding ants. So easiest way to tell, flip it over. The first line of the instruction says, pour this on the mound. Uh, that's not viable for fire ants. You're not gonna be able to uh, find all the nests like we had, like I had mentioned, like there's hundreds of nests on your property. You're not gonna find it on. You can't sprinkle this stuff on it. Um, so just be aware there are um, a different target for these pesticides. So the simplest way is just check out the instructions. Um, we, we used to hear this a lot, not too much anymore, but like, oh, I just use RAID or I just use Orange Guard. And that's, that's great for your comfort, for in your home. Um, all these other things, these contact, essentially contact uh, killers are, will work on fire ants. Um, but it's only good for the short term, like I had said, for your comfort, like, oh, you're getting stung in your bathroom. Sure, you can wipe the counter with this stuff or kill whatever workers you see just so you stop getting stung in your house. Um, but just be aware that these ants that are stinging you is only about 10% of the colony. 90% is at home taking care of the queen and her babies. Um, my favorite fun fact, uh, these to this 10% of ants, these are the oldest ants. They're reaching the end of their life cycle. So if they don't come back, the colony doesn't really care. Uh, foraging is the hardest job that um, worker ants can have. So what they do is they send out, oh, if all these old guys, like, oh, if you don't come back, it's fine. Like the colony is stable, we don't need you. But if you get, come back, great, now we have food and water. Uh, so if you killed every single ant you found, um, that's the only 10% of the colony. Yeah, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use a bait. Contact sprays are great for your comfort, but it's not enough. Um, so I'm going to go over all these different uh, baits. Um, and just so you guys know, we all these baits are set, um, tested separately by um, CTAR, which is the College of Agriculture, and the Hawaii Ant Lab. And while these are all great products, it's never a one and done situation. It's always, you're gonna need to be treating for multiple months or multiple years before you can actually get rid of them. And I'm uh, gonna keep saying it, no matter what you pick, uh, whichever is best for you, as long as you treat every four to six weeks, um, you'll make a dent in the colony. Uh, I'm gonna start off by talking about the gel bait that was designed by the Hawaii Ant Lab. Uh, this is good for areas where there's uh, lots of tall trees, uh, lots of vegetation, um, especially lots of fruit trees. Um, it's 
the gel bait itself is uh, relatively simple. It's essentially everything you can pick up at the store. So I'm going to play this video for you guys. It's like our little cooking video. Um, pretty much all it is, uh, you get all your mixing things together, a couple buckets, um, measuring things and whatever sprayer you're going to use. And then the first bucket, you're going to put your water and your tangle. Tangle is the insecticide in this case. And uh, this can be swapped out with um, another pesticide that I'll talk about later on. And this uh, second bucket, you're going to have your vegetable oil, peanut butter, and xanthan gum. Um, any kind of oil works. Uh, we tell people just get the cheapest you could find, um, canola, veggie oil, whatever it is. Um, as long as it's um, not like gross rancid oil. Um, same thing with peanut butter. Obviously no, cre uh, no crunchy because we're spraying and it needs to go through the nozzle. Um, but creamy peanut butter, any brand, nothing natural or organic. They actually don't like those. They like the cheapest kind, kinds you can get. Um, Sanctum gum was the third um, ingredient. Pretty much uh, it's a thickener and emulsifier. Keeps the water and oil from separating. Uh, you can get that at the in any baking aisle, uh, but if you have access to Amazon or something, it is significantly cheaper online. And so you, you can kind of see like after mixing it turned into that like goopy substance. That's kind of what we're going for. Um, you can spray that up into trees where it'll stick to branches and trunks and where the like where the ants are foraging. Um, so same thing as the survey video. Uh, that video is also on our website. Um, so you can check it out like if you need a kind of like a refresher. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Tangle right now, which is the thing you saw going into the pest, uh, into the gel bait. Um, the active ingredient is S methoprene. Uh, this is it doesn't kill worker or queen ant, so it's not toxic, but it's uh, we call it um, ant birth control. Uh, when the queen ingests this, she um, stops laying eggs or lays very, very few eggs. Um, so because of that, it does have kind of like a long wait time. Uh, you won't probably, you probably won't see a reduction in the population for three or four months. Um, reason is that's about the life cycle of an average worker ant. So they all have to die of natural causes before you notice a reduction in that population. Uh, this is safe for uh, mammals and birds. So we, we've had chickens, cats, dogs follow us around when we're spraying this because it is peanut butter. Um, it doesn't affect them. It's, it's also in very, very small quantities to affect the, the queen ant, which is thousands and thousands of times smaller than your cat or dog. Um, but it does affect um, fish and other marine animals. So there is a problem with treating near lakes and beaches and things like that and near rivers. Um, we can't get, let this get into the water. Um, in the jug, uh, all by itself, the tango is shelf stable, so it'll last for a couple years. Uh, but once you mix it into the gel bait, it's only good for about 24 hours. After that, it starts, uh, the oil water mixture starts to go bad and get kind of stinks. So you only want to mix as much as you need. Uh, do we have any questions on the gel bait and tango before I get into toxicant baits? There was a question about, um what you can use to mix if you don't have the tool. So I don't know if she was talking about the drill or the attachment. Oh, okay. Um, so, Cause especially with the paint mixer, it's when you're making like big, like gallons, like we have like the five gallon bucket. Um, if you only need a small amount, you can use like an old, like those little handheld kitchen mixers. That'll be good enough, but just make sure this is my pesticide only mixer and you like keep it outside, don't put it back in your kitchen and that'll work too. And everything else is just buckets and measuring things that you can get at any old store. Jade, someone else asked about using beef liver as the protein source. Oh, yes. Uh, that's also, uh, you can substitute that for the peanut butter. Like if you're allergic to nuts or something, you can use the beef liver powder. Um, I don't want to say one is more attractive than the other, um, but in some cases where, oh, I can't use peanuts at all, um, beef liver powder works, and, but it is more pricey 
And I think you can get that at like the health food store. People put it in smoothies or something really gross. Jade, we have a question on Facebook about how much area a five gallon amount of bait would cover. Uh, it's, it does come out to one gallon per acre. Um, so five gallon bucket, uh, five acres. But say you have a, a lot, a lot of vegetation, you can go up to uh, two gallons an acre. And then one more question, not necessarily about the bait, but about the elevation in which little fire ants can um, survive at. Um, they've been found all the way up in volcanoes, so I'm not sure yet. And I know there's ant, they, they do ant surveys, not for little fire ants, but for other ants at like the summit of Mauna Kea. So I don't want to, I don't want people to think just because I live at a high elevation, I'm safe from fire ants. Uh, so we're not sure what their range is exactly. So it'd be like, like we were mentioning, maybe best, uh, on the safe side just to survey, uh, just in case. Jade. I think somebody said something, but it was really quiet. So Steve wants to know if rain affects the tango bait at all. Um, heavy, heavy downpour will just because it'll wash it away. Um, light drizzle and it should be fine. If anything, it'll keep the bait moist. Um, because ants are liquid feeders. Uh, they need the bait. Once the bait dries out, it's, they can't access it anymore. So some rain is okay. Uh, but it does, um, when it starts raining, they do forage a lot less. So it's some rain is okay, uh, pouring rain is not good. And, and this, this will kind of apply to the next set um, of pesticides too. Uh, as long as you treat, and this is the magic numbers again, four to, as long as you have four to six hours of not rain, you should be good enough for that, that month's treatment. That's enough time for them to find the bait uh, and take it back to the queen. So if you treat in the morning, it storms in um, at night, you're fine. You got in your treatment for the month. Yeah. Was there any more questions? Um, there's someone asking about peripheral areas. And so I think we're gonna probably get into that a little bit more as you continue to talk about. Uh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna move to that next, right? Yeah, well, that's at the end, but yeah, I'll talk about those. Okay. We have one question about xanthan gum and where you can find that. Um, any grocery store should carry it in the baking aisle. It is kind of pricey here. Uh, we found Amazon is the cheapest. Uh, it's like almost half the price on Amazon. Uh, but yeah, if you don't, uh, nobody can buy order online, uh, uh, baking aisle. Okay, I'm going to move on about uh, toxic, talk about toxic baits. Uh, but if you think of a question later about gel baits or uh, tango, just uh, keep sending it in and I'll, we'll cover it uh, in the next like, section. Uh, so that was our insect growth regulator, the birth control. Now we're going to talk about uh, toxicants. So these kill workers and queens. Um, same thing as the tangle. They're both, all of these are, are safe for mammals and birds. Um, it doesn't affect their bodies and it's in such tiny, tiny amounts that they would have to, ascend, they would, to become affected, they would have to um, ingest the concentrate like before all the mixture. Um, but some of these do have uh, places where you can't, a little more places where you can't apply them versus the, the tangle. Uh, first one we're going to talk about is Provant, which is a powder. It goes into the gel bait. Like this would replace the tangle. So it's like, oh, I want to use a toxicant instead of tangle, but I got a lot of vegetation. This is what you would use. Um, this is not approved for fruit trees and crops, meaning this, if you have an orchard, this is probably not what you're going to go for. Um, uh, so so kind of the same thing, because it's in, in, inside the gel bait, it is a little bit resistant to rain, so some rain is okay, pouring rain's not okay. Um, 
the main downside about this product is they don't make that pill jar size anymore. Like we have it um, on the slide, the company stopped making it. It only comes in uh, large sizes. So it's not really practical for a homeowner like by themselves to buy. It's more for someone who has a nursery um, or if you're working with a group that can split it up. Um, these are the more common things people see, uh, the granular uh, toxicants. Uh, so these are uh, corn grits that are soaked with oil and the active ingredient. Uh, so there's no mixing involved. You just open it and you apply it. Uh, it varies from one pound to two pounds or more an acre. Um, because each product is different, make sure to read the instructions first. It'll specify on there. Um, and some are approved for fruits and crops and others are not. So uh, especially for these, well, actually for all, all these pesticides, you want to make sure to read what the labels say first uh, before you do anything else. Um, the downside about these uh, types of baits is that they're very sensitive to moisture. So if you if it rained the night before, you go out to treat your property in the morning and the ground is still kind of wet, you're going to want to wait till um, it, everything's dry. These corn grits will soak up water and it kind of mushy and gross and the ants don't really like it after that. Um, but with kind of with that in mind, once you open the bag or the jug that these things come in, it's only good for about three months. So you only want to purchase the amount you need in three months or unless you're splitting it with somebody. Um, we've talked to a few people, it's like, oh yeah, I used a uh, siesta as an example. And it was great for the first, um, the first few times and after that it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work anymore. And after talking with them, they're like, oh yeah, I've been using the same bag for a year. So majority of their treatment, it was, there was uh, either the bait was stale and the ants were eating or there was no active ingredient anymore. Um, so best thing to do is you open the container and write the date on it. Oh, it's past three months. This is essentially no good anymore. You can throw it away. Uh, these are just some of the granulars out there that have been tested. Um, Siesta is one of the names thrown around a lot. This can be used for citrus, stone fruit, uh, palm fruit, and nuts, um, but not uh, tropical fruit, which is bananas and essentially everything else. Lily koi, all of that is, if it's not a citrus or a stone fruit or a nut, it's probably a berry uh, or a tropical fruit, which is not on the label. Uh, the active ingredient is metaflumazone. Um, same active ingredient, different product is called Ultravin, only available for mac nuts and citrus. These two only come in really large bags, like you can see. So unless you're splitting it with the group or you own some, an orchard or something, this is probably not the product for you. Because uh, you can't, if you have a, a small lot, you can't use that that much in three months and it's just going to go bad. Um, Amdro is probably what most homeowners uh, go to. Uh, you can buy it at KTA, Home Depot, Ace, all those kinds of places. It comes in a little one pound jug. Um, active ingredient is hydromethanone. Um, but it's not labeled for uh, fruits and crops. So you're not supposed to apply it to your fruit trees and stuff, but it's good for um, if you have maybe grass and some small shrubs. If you got a lot of vegetation, these granules, none of these granules are probably going to be good for that because you can't get them to stick up into the trees. Um, Antix is the newest uh, bait product that was tested. It was only um, available to purchase maybe like a few months ago, like this year. Um, this is an organic pesticide. Um, spinosad is a commonly used um, organic active ingredient. Um, and this can be used for almost all edible crops. I think the only one that's not on there that I went through was coffee, but coffee is its own separate thing in agriculture. So this will cover mostly everything else on your property if you have a lot of tropical fruits. Um, but if you're, um, an organic certified farm, you're still not allowed to use antics because it's not organically certified because the corn grit and the oil itself is not orga an organic product, unfortunately. Um, I just want to mention because some of these are like, oh, this one I can use for fruits, this one I cannot. Uh, I just want to mention that while it's very important to follow the label, if you accidentally apply one of these products to your orange tree or something by mistake, um, it's not hazardous to you. The, the tree does not absorb these pesticides and stores it in the fruit or anything like that. It's just, if you apply it there, that's, it's, it's going to stay where you put it and then it's just going to dissolve. Uh, it's just not on the label, but if you do it by mistake, it's not harmful. 
Um, so after I went over all of those different pesticides, the main thing to remember is you want to treat um, every four to six weeks apart, no matter which one you pick, whether you pick the tangle, whether you pick a granular, it's four to six weeks. And that, that doesn't change no matter which one you pick. Um, do we have any questions about the toxicants before I get into the rest of the stuff? There are a bunch of questions. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Somebody was asking about um, the effects on reptiles. Um, I don't believe there's any effect on reptiles on, with any of the products. Also, um, Susie wants to know if all of the products that we're talking about are safe for pets and chickens. Yes. Yeah, of, of course, as, as much as we can, we don't want them to eat these things mostly because then the ants don't get it and then your ants are still alive, but they would need to eat huge, huge amounts of this to even uh, get sick. Uh, I still like Springer's pig as the best example. Her, uh, our boss's pig got into a 15 pound bag of siesta, ate half of it because it was like, oh, this is cool. Didn't even get a stomach ache and the pig is still alive and happy. And that was a couple years ago. Um. Tuck has a question about Amdro. Mm -hmm. He says it seems to clump up after he puts it in his bait trap, especially after the rain, and he wants to know if it still will kill the fire ants. Um, probably not, actually. Uh, we've tested weathered baits, and it's, like, it's not effective. At, it's very, very little effective. It maybe it will kill a few workers, but the queens are fine. Um, if you're using bait traps, um, out, um, they're great for indoors, like you put it under the bathroom sink or the kitchen sink in places like that. Um, but if you're treating outside, you're, you're better off broadcasting it as sprinkling it all over the place versus keeping them contained. Um, little fire ants, they don't really um, smell like we do. They communicate with chemical signatures. So what they do to make up for it is they send out those thousands of workers to find something that they like to eat. So they'll have to come across the granular eat it, um, leave a trail and go back home that says, hey, there's something good over there. And the other workers are come across that trail and go back and pick up the, the, the granulars. We've seen, um, like if we have like a trail of granulars or droplets of tango or something, sometimes they'll be surrounding maybe two of the 20 blobs of bait just because they haven't wandered a few steps to the right or left to find the next droplet. So even if it's right in front of them, they may not necessarily find it unless somebody else ate it, tested it first, and then told everybody else. So when you're using a bait station, you're putting hundreds of granulars into a little thing, you're reducing your chance of finding it to one instead of a hundred or so. Um, but if you really like your bait stations, um, once you put it out there, uh, you want to throw it out the next day. So uh, fill up the bait station or whatever, um, 24 hours later, go back out and throw it all away. Because at that point, it's these, uh, granular baits especially are meant to break down in the environment so it's sitting out there um, it's slowly breaking down the ants may you still may see the ants going to it a few days later but at that point they're getting maybe like half the dose or whatever like it's not its full strength and they're only going to get sick and not die and all you're doing is prolonging their um their memory which is oh yeah don't eat this yellow stuff because everybody gets sick when we eat this yellow stuff um Versus if you take it away after after about a month, which is why we still wait the four weeks to treat again, is they kind of forgot what was that thing we ate that, you know, like half of us died, like we can't remember. Uh, so if you're using your bait stations, clear it out after. It's not killing them after a couple of days and you're only prolonging the memory of it. Um, I have another question and I'll answer this one, Jay, because I looked it up. Uh, okay. John was asking about over and out, um, fire advanced fire ant killer and i looked it up and it turns out that that is a contact pesticide so uh the short answer well it's a yes and no answer but you're about to get into contact pesticides i believe so uh john if you will hang in there um yes it will kill them but it is not a bait and jade's going to explain uh what that means mm -hmm. uh did you have more questions on that end kavehi I think, okay, there you go. 
we did get a question about, I guess a, Shireen needed clarification on when you're using um, pesticides on edible crops. So are you actually making contact with the veggies or are you just using it around your garden bed? Um, if you're using a, the gel bait on a fruit tree, you're gonna aim for, or any tree, you're gonna aim for the trunk and the branches. You don't necessarily need to get it on the, all the leaves and stuff because the ants are living in the bark under moss and stuff. So that's where you wanna shoot it. Of, of course, if it's fruiting, you don't wanna try to avoid the fruits the best you can. But if you do get some of the gel bait on it, just wash it off and you should be okay. Um, it's for uh, ground veggies, like garden beds and stuff like that. Just apply it between the rows or around it. I wouldn't spray it directly on those. Especially because they're normally, those are pretty small, uh, small plants. Unlikely that the ants are living actually like in the in the lettuce or in the beans or s stuff like that. So treating around it in between it should be enough. I wouldn't apply uh, granulars directly to like my head of lettuce or something like that. That was it. Okay. Um, before I talk about the contact killers like Franny mentioned, I am going to talk about our HUI program real quick. Uh, because of social distancing, a lot of this is on hold. Uh, but if you, because I, if you do remember, a lot of those pesticides came in huge sizes, not fit for a single person. Uh, so one of the things you recommend is coming together uh, with your like, neighborhood to do it. Um, and we do have a program that we will come out there and help you guys get started. Um, all you need is at least six, six people who live relatively close together, like walking distance to be like, yes, we want to treat for fire ants and give us a call or an email or you can hang out at the end and talk to us. Um, it's essentially, I'm going to do a similar presentation and we can do it online like this because we can't meet with uh, big groups right now. And then I hope you guys come up with a plan, show you how to mix a gel bait, how to apply it. And essentially you'll get reminders from me to um, stay on schedule essentially. So you get to talk to me once a month. And of course I'm available for any questions. So this is our, um, our neighborhood program really, really quick. Um, Main benefit of working with neighbors, of course, is buying that huge container of pesticide that essentially would go to waste or you can't just drop $400 or whatever it is on two gallons of Tango. Um, that's the main reason. Um, it's And buying everything in bulk, the oil, the peanut butter, all that stuff, buying anything in bulk is always cheaper anyway. Um, labor sharing, somebody gets sick or breaks their leg. Uh, these things do happen. It actually happened in a few of our groups. Um, and people are able to help each other out because like I kept saying, the main thing is keep on schedule. So even if you're not available for whatever reason, hopefully somebody can help you out and you can return the favor later on. Um, and this is the really important for me is accountability. I can write uh, treat fire ants on my calendar as much as I want. Am I actually gonna do it on that day? Uh, maybe there's like a 50% chance. I'll see it and decide to put it off to tomorrow and then forget and all, all that always happens for me at least. But if I know I'm meeting everybody tomorrow morning, I'm going to do it because people are expecting me to be there. Um, so it's just more chances and this is another way to keep you on schedule. And of course, it's more enjoyable. Lots of people have turned this into brunch and margaritas and all kinds of other things. So it's not just like, ew, I have to treat for fire ants. It's a, they turn it into a fun get together for their neighbors. Hey, that was the fun part. If you have questions about that after, we can talk at the very end. Um, so the main thing and this is where I get into barrier treatments. Um, this is also where it gets confusing with some people, like that product that came up. It does say kill fire ants on it, um, but Franny just looking quickly at the label, she could tell, oh, that wasn't a bait product, which is all those other things that we talked about, but this is a, um, a barrier treatment or a contact killer. Um, ideally, a, a bait is something that the ants are attracted to, like, ooh, this tastes yummy, and they take it home to their queen and feed it to her versus barriers and contact sprays is they have to touch it uh, for it to affect them. Um, so keep in mind, you can treat your property and do everything correct, get rid of all your ants, but there's still a chance the little fires will always come back in. They're hitchhikers, so they're moving around with our, with our stuff. And a lot of times it is unintentional. Um, we, we still see people like, oh, I'm, like you're just being nice. Like I have this really nice potted plant or I have this, uh, I can't even think, somebody gave it to us even. It was some kind of really huge fruit. We're like, oh, this is awesome. And then it was, um, had fire ants in it. 
like it was they don't mean to do it it's just they're trying to be nice and they're accidentally spreading fire ants um so that's another reason why we, we do want to always tell people to survey because these things could come in on your property by mistake at any time and the quicker you find it with a survey the sooner you can treat it because then if that was the case you found the ants and they're only oh there's only like a tiny pocket of my property that has fire ants versus you don't survey you won't notice them until they're all over the place and you're getting stung okay, and i'll talk about barrier treatments and quarantines if the slide will change there we go um so barrier treatments, these are contact uh, residual pesticides, meaning I'm going to spray it or apply it to these areas and they're gonna stay there for two or three months. Um, they come in granulars or, or uh, pre-mixed liquids, sometimes concentrate liquids. Um, a, the most common active ingredients we see is bifenthrin and cyfluthrin, there may be a few others. Um, main difference between these barrier treatments and like the orange guard kind of things, uh, orange guard raid, are also contact sprays, but they don't last. You have to directly see the ant, spray it on them for it to work. Um, the ants can cross over that area after and probably be fine. With these uh, barrier treatments, um, once it dries, uh, it'll last about three months, two to three months, depending on whether if there's a lot of rain, of course, you wanna reapply sooner. Um, but they'll crawl across this invisible fence and they'll die. Um, it also works on spiders, creepy crawlies. You can kind of see on that home defense picture is like uh, kills all bugs so just be aware this is not something you want to take and apply it all over your backyard because it will also affect bees and butterflies and other beneficial insects these are great when they're used how they're supposed to be um, so you can if you're having problems with ants in your house you can take any of these products and you can spray the perimeter of your house um, any of the posts and piers where the pipes are coming in places where the ants will crawl and get into your house um, this will keep them out while you're treating outside. So this is not your uh, only thing you can do. This is just to make it more, you more comfortable. Or if um, when you wanna do your um, quarantine, like how you can see these logs are getting surrounded by the, the barrier treatment, essentially what they're doing is I brought home these logs, but do they have fire ants in it? And they don't wanna just leave it there for the ants to come out and reinfest their property. So, um, because they just sprayed this barrier treatment, the ants cannot escape essentially. They'll crawl out, touch that thing, and they'll die. So what you would do is you would put a peanut butter stick or whatever you used to survey like near those um, logs or whatever it is. It could be potted plants. It could be construction material like roofing and lumber. It could be gravel. It could be mulch. Um, anything essentially that sits for a long period of time not moving in an infected area has a chance to have fire ants in it. Um, Check it with the peanut butter stick, half an hour, an hour later, no more nothing, then you can move, the, move it out of the quarantine zone. If there is, if you do find ants um, within the quarantine zone, you can either return the item or whatever, because sometimes that's what the stores need to kind of get into it. Like, oh, maybe we should treat our fire ants because we're not making money. Um, or if it's, it was a gift or something like, something like these logs, you can't return really those logs anywhere. Uh, you can just treat it with, um, Something like Amdro, just an eat, like the granular treatments or the, the bait granulars, just sprinkle it over there and you can check it uh, in a day or two. Um, if you still find ants, you feel free to apply a little bit more. The reason being is because they can't escape, hopefully they'll just starve to death on their own, uh, but you're also force feeding them th that bait. Even if they kind of knew, oh, this is not the good thing to eat, there's nothing else for them. And you're gonna keep doing that until you put the peanut butter stick and there's nothing there, and then you can move it out. Um, besides your quarantine, you can also use this to put a, a fence between you and say there's a, um, an empty lot or a neighbor that doesn't treat or whatever the case. Um, you can apply this to your, the perimeter of your property. So the ants uh, will try to crawl over it, touch it and die. Um, but make sure you get really good coverage because if it is if it is spotty, if you don't do do like a solid cover like you saw in the previous picture, they will find their way through. Or if like a branch falls over it, they'll, they'll use the branch to crawl right over it. So you kind of got to watch that area and, and reapply the barrier when needed. Um, some other things you can do that's uh, not pesticide related, just kind of reduce the habitat. So if you do have that, um, like there's the 
area next to you not getting treated, you can trim back any foliage, reduce the leaf litter in that area. Essentially, they would stay there versus coming into your, your yard, unless the population is so high that they don't have a choice and they're like full capacity over there, then they'll move over. Um, if you do have ants in your yard, they're getting into your house. Uh, you can trim off any of like, if there's leaves or bushes touching your house, you, have to, you can trim all of that back because that's just extra ways for them to get into your house. And of course, you still, you're gonna wanna be surveying to see what's going on. Cause you can kind of do all these things and be like, do exactly what we said and still get ants just by chance. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, um, they do like to raft, meaning they'll hold hands and float down the river. Um, so people at the beach get stung, people surfing, uh, while they're just wading out in the water, they'll swim into a raft of ants. They'll also do that on your property. So saying you put your barrier treatments up, everything's fine, but somebody up the road of you has ants and it, there's like a storm or lots of rain, it is possible that for them to raft down, float over your barrier and reinvest your property. Yeah, these, these guys know all the, all the tricks for home invasion. So thank you guys for listening. This is all our contact info. Uh, we'll, I guess we'll continue on into questions. Jade, um, I think just this is a really common problem and, and Duane had an, asked this earlier, but I think it might be good just to talk about it more. Um, when people have an absentee lot next door, uh, you know, especially here in Pune or in Hilo, uh, where we have these sort of jungly kind of lots and no one's really treating that area, mm -hmm. what, would, what would be the owner's best approach to, you know, not constantly having those little fire ants uh, coming in? Yeah, that's always really hard. Um, your best bet would probably be to try to get in contact with the owner and just be like, hey, I'm going to be treating at least some of your property to it. So you, if you ever make the gel bait, it sprays maybe like 10 or 15 feet so you can still stay on your property and treat that way and kind of push them back. And unfortunately, it's going to just be something that you have to treat all the time to kind of keep them at bay at least. But treating... Um, one section of your property, like just that border is still much better than treating like if you're especially important like the whole acre. Franny. Um, and another question, Jade, um, you know, what is, we have sort of a protocol that we recommend to folks, even though we tell people not to get too tripped up on like, oh, I have to, you know, only treat with the perfect product. Uh, you wanna share the recommended protocol and just kind of discuss about, um, uh, resistance uh, to pesticides. Oh yeah, that's very important. Um, normally what we do, and this is what they do on um, the neighbor islands when the uh, Hawaii Ant Lab and the Department of Ag go out to uh, treat these active areas, is we like to start off with Tangle first. Um, what this does is it'll kind of destabilize the colony. Um, say give it to her for the first half of the year so like six six treatments um she's struggling to lay eggs everyone's kind of freaking out because there's no new workers getting produced and then you can come in with a few treatments of a toxicant whether it's provant uh to keep up with the gel bait if you have a lot of vegetation or if it's uh, granular like amdra or siesta or something um so hopefully what will happen is this will kill off whoever's remaining after your treatment with the tangle um, so it is a kind of like a long-term treatment. So it is gonna take maybe about a year, six months to tangle, six months of a toxic and bait uh, to get like the best result, the best results, or this is what they, uh, the, uh, they do on neighbor islands or they're trying to do eradication efforts. Um, but it's still not necessarily like the best because we've also talked to people who they don't like toxic and baits for uh, personal reasons and they use tangle for the whole year. And they've also gotten down to uh, very few ants or no ants, um, or even the opposite. Some people are like, no, I don't have a lot of fruit trees. I don't have vegetation. I have a shrub here and there, mostly grass, uh, where gel bait's not viable for that, or not the best option for that. So they just start off immediately with a granular bait, and that works too. Um, so it's, it's still up to you what you want to choose with. If you want to do that half-half or you want to just focus on a single one. Uh, but Fran, like Franny mentioned, um, rotating your pesticides is always good 
because um, we don't want to build resistance. They haven't showed um, signs of becoming resistant to any of these pesticides. Um, but for example, if you, if you want to stick with your uh, toxicant baits, you can still rotate between Siesta and Amjo or something like that because they have different active ingredients. Um, uh, I think that was most of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to real quick, Jade, I'm going to share my screen okay. and go over to, um, okay, yes, share. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right, so this is our website, and just really quickly, I want to show people that we do have a lot of resources in Little Fire Ants uh, that you can explore. You can go to Pest, and there's a drop down here or go right to the little fire ant program. See that big ant face right there? And that'll take you into our little fire ant area. Um, this menu down here on the left side is gonna be uh, all the resources that you really uh, wanna look at. Um, the community program that Jay talked about, uh, not too many upcoming events right now, but hopefully within the next year, we'll get back on that. Um, but really, uh, some of the best stuff here, helpful links, videos, and documents is exactly what it says it is. So some of those videos that uh, Jade showed, learning how to uh, mix uh, your bait, um, just general information about little fire ants, and uh, some printouts with the recipes for the gel bait. So real easy recipe if you want to print that out. There's a calendar that you can print out that can help you plan how you want to approach your uh, little fire ant treatments over the next year. And that calendar also includes the different product names. So uh, that's a great handy little item to have. Um, if you have neighbors that are absentee and you want to send them a letter and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to treat for fire ants. Is it okay if I, you know, kind of treat on your property? We do have that uh, in there and you'd be surprised how many people will, will actually, you know, send you some money and say, yeah, sure. I don't want that when I come there. Um, and then very important, we have some labels on here, uh, local needs labels. Um, we also have that here under products to control little fire ants. So if you want more information about those products, we have a whole page here that lists the different types of baits that Jade talked about, uh, those toxicant baits. And when you click on the, the bait name, it will take you to the label. So you can really get into where that product should be used, how it should be used, how you're supposed to keep yourself safe while using it. And we really recommend that anytime you're using pesticides, you do take that extra step to sit and, and read your label because that is there for your protection and the protection of the environment and also to help make sure that you're using that product in the most effective way possible. So we have all the different uh, products here. If the product is not listed here, just because it says fire ants, that does not mean it works for this species of fire ants. These products have been tested here in Hawaii on our fire ants here, the type of species that we are plagued by. So I would not go outside of this list um, because we, we don't know what the effective uh, uh, attractiveness or impact of, of other products are uh, that have not been tested. So these have all been tested here. We have the Hawaii Ant Lab uh, that does the research. So. I would go with what's on this list. Um, and then of course we have the tango there. And then the barrier treatments, that is the contact insecticides. Remember that those are not your long-term, uh, they're a prevention. They are not going to take care of the fire ants you have. So you do not wanna use those uh, in a way to try and actually reduce the colonies. Um, but those are all really, and then, oh, I almost skipped it. At the very bottom here, the Little Fire Ant Buyer's Guide, which has just recently been updated. This will actually give you uh, a printout that you can use to contact the various stores and find out, you know, we have all the phone numbers, wh who has what. So this will tell you which products they usually carry, and then you can call them ahead of time and say, hey, do you have this in stock? So, um, that's going to be updated soon. Oh no, here we go. It does have the update with the with the new organic products, the the antics. So um, that's a great website for you to kind of go and find all. And pretty soon we're going to have this this recording up on there. But that's uh, some place that you can go and explore some more about what Jade talked about today, and also take some information with you to the store um, and and sit down and do your planning. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing there, let people explore. What do we have on Facebook, Vahi? Any questions we need to wrap up before we close? 
Um, I think we answered all the questions on Facebook. Great. Molly, how's everything on Zoom? Um, will Tall Star be effective when it's raining all the time? Oh. Say, I believe the label for Tall Star says it's effective for three months. Maybe you want to apply it at a one month interval instead or one and a half months. I would just assume that it's not lasting its full duration, especially if you're getting a lot of rain. And so Home Defense says treatment is good for 12 months. What do you suggest? How long does it really last around yeah, the house <laughs> and as a border treatment? Maybe in your house, because you, it does say you can use it as a crack and crevice treatment. So like the edges of rooms and under the bathroom sink and places like that. Mm -hmm. um, things like that would definitely last much longer. 12 months is still seems kind of like a stretch, but if you're not seeing any ants in the house anymore, you should be fine. Um, but if you're applying it outside where it's exposed to sun and rain, it's definitely not lasting 12 months. Um, so an indicator for that, they like say um, you're treating your house to keep the ants out. Once you start to see the ants come back in, then you can apply again. And then you can kind of use that as your uh, kind of like a marker. It's like, oh, that took three months. In another three months, I'll apply again. Or if it lasted a little longer, maybe we didn't have a bunch of rain or it was really overcast or something lasted four or, months, stuff like that. Or apply it while you're treating using bait in your yard so that hopefully you don't need to reapply because the bait yes. will have worked and you won't have ants <laughs> yes. in your yard anymore to get into your house. Mm -hmm. so it would be a nice yeah. uh, sort of buy you some time while you treat in mm -hmm. your yard. Yeah, that, um, that's mainly what they're for. You're not going to just stick with a barrier. You're going to have to use it with a bait also. Barriers are not your only product. Um, and we also had someone asking about borax and the effectiveness of borax. Um, borax is commonly used in sugar ant baits, so those little black ants you see in the kitchen, uh, white-footed ants, stuff like that. Those are the best for borax. I believe the mixture is even borax, wet cat food, and corn syrup, but same thing, corn syrup is sweet, so it's for sugar eating ants. Um, I believe the Hoi Anup has a recipe if you're, if that's what you're looking for, uh, but it's unlikely to affect little fire ants, um, just because how I had mentioned, they like to ranch those aphids and stuff like that. That's where they're getting their sugar and carbohydrates from. So they may kind of check out a sweet thing, but they're not gonna swarm it like if it was peanut butter or some other heavy protein source. Um, I also like to kind of say don't, go with the home remedy kind of method because these ants are really tricky. Uh, the Hoi Ant Lab spent years developing the gel bait uh, because if you don't give them enough um, pesticide, it doesn't affect them. If you put too much in it, they can tell. They'll go up to it and be like, oh, this tastes weird or it smells weird and they don't eat it at all. So they had to do years of research to determine the right ratio of pesticide to uh, attractive bait things. Uh, so borax, not the best for fire ants, but it's great for those sugar eating ants and uh, stay away from those home remedy kind of things. Yeah, I think that's always good advice with pesticides. Um, and uh, Kathy is asking a question that I know we get all the time. It affects a lot of people on our, our east side, especially. Um, what's the best thing to do if you're living in the jungle and you're just surrounded by vegetation? Um, Cut back any vegetation from touching your house as much as you can. For the rest of it, uh, if there's fruit trees in it, like a bunch of fruit trees, you're going to have to use Tangle and probably double up on the Tangle. So two gallons per acre instead of the one. Um, if it's just kind of jungly, you're not harvesting anything from there, Provence going to be your best bet. Okay, I think that wraps up all the questions that we had. Um, and of course you did, can you show that final screen again, uh, Jade, that had the, um, uh, had all the emails and such on there. Um, as I said, our, our website is bisc.org. Um, right there, there's our phone number. Obviously we're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, 
And there's all the emails, Jade's email, second one down there, Jade me at hawaii.edu. She is happy to answer all kinds of random little fire ant questions. If you want to shoot her an email as you're going through this process, I'd uh, say, oh, I, I ran into this kind of weird situation, or I just I can't remember what you said about this particular thing. Please feel free to reach out. That's what we're here for. Um, we are a grant funded program. So um, we get grants to bring education to you guys and, and help out the community. So that's, that's the whole uh, goal. So we're happy to help you in any way that we can. Um, I do appreciate everyone being here today. And I thank you for giving your time to um, learn about this invasive species and fight this invasive species. And I want to thank uh, Jade, Kavehi, and Molly for jumping in here all this whole time and making sure everybody got their questions answered. Um, mahalo to everybody and have a wonderful day. There was a raised hand thing. Not sure what I don't, think, on it. I don't think they ever um, typed a question. <laughs>